words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I want to thank you all for coming out to this talk. Um, there is a handout. Uh, does everyone have a copy? Is there anyone who does not have a copy? I believe there were plenty moving around there. Okay, good. Looks like everyone is uh, in possession of a copy. So I'm talking about um, the, the interrelations of moral and spiritual formation or of the natural and supernatural moral formation as it, as it was in one iteration of the title. Um, and basically what I have on the slides here is just a lot of text from Dallas Willard that um, sort of illustrates uh, some points that um, I'll be making here. I'm not going to have time to read through all of them, so you know I'm just going to point to a few choice quotes here and there. We can go back and look at them later if we want to examine uh, the textual basis for the kinds of things I'm going to be saying here. But the first thing I want to start off with is um, just getting clear on uh, what Dallas's notion of spiritual formation is. And what you have up here on the slide is um, bits and pieces, well, broken into chunks, uh, of Dallas's most complete statement on um, what spiritual formation is. And we won't, we won't read through all of it here, but um, you can see that the three, there are three different senses of uh, the term spiritual formation that Dallas um, recognizes. And one is just training in spiritual disciplines. And then there's um, what we might call the shaping of the spirit. And then there's the shaping by the spirit of human personality. Uh, what's most important for our purposes today is that second sense of spiritual formation, the, the shaping of the human spirit, uh, the spiritual aspect of personality. So I will just read that second part of the slide there. Secondly, spiritual formation may be thought of as the shaping of the inner life, the spirit, or the spiritual side of the human being. The formation of the heart or will, which I believe is best taken as the spirit, uh, of the individual along with the emotions and the intellect is therefore the primary focus regardless of what overt practices may or may not be involved. Here what is formed is explicitly the spiritual dimension of the self. We may speak of spiritual formation in this case precisely because that which is formed, the subject matter shaped, is the spirit or sorry, the spiritual aspect of personality. Um, so that's sort of the heart of spiritual formation for Dallas, I think. And then um, sort of around the, the edges, you've got um, training in spiritual disciplines, and then you have uh, the activity of, of God himself and other spiritual entities, uh, which is what I'm going to call shaping, shaping by the spirit here. Um, so then on the handout here, that you have the point here, point two, um, which is just that this second meaning of spiritual formation, that just is character formation, as it has traditionally been understood in the Western intellectual tradition. And that character formation just is what has been meant by moral formation for most of our intellectual history. So spiritual formation, um, character formation, moral formation, all of these overlap precisely at this point of the shaping of the inner person or the shaping of the spirit. And you've got um, a couple of, of quotations from Dallas here. First one, the spiritual side of the human being, Christian and non-Christian alike, develops into the reality which it becomes for good or ill. Everyone receives spiritual formation just as everyone gets an education. The only question is whether it's a good one or a bad one. And in the next uh, quotation there, he emphasizes that um, even being in a bad moral condition or spiritual condition is the result of a spiritual formation. Right? And he says it's um, spiritual formation refers to how the basic elements of human life, the will, the thoughts, the feelings, the body, the social relationships, and the depths of the soul have been shaped so that character and life come out of how they have been shaped. So that's the, the center of spiritual formation. And when we understand spiritual formation in that particular sense, um, spiritual formation is not a distinctively Christian endeavor. It's not even a distinctively religious endeavor. It's something that most human cultures have in one way or another um, been engaged in uh, throughout human history. And one place this comes up is in the Western philosophical tradition. Um, as Dallas understands it, Plato was a teacher of spiritual formation, not just moral formation. He says in one of his articles, that's actually a, an, an interview, I think. Uh, when I began to study philosophy, I saw from the very beginning that Plato's Republic 
is essentially a book on spiritual formation. Now, um, let me get a gauge of how many of you are familiar with Plato's Republic and the views. Okay, so it sounds like most of you. Okay, so good. I don't have to do a lot of explaining about that, but you know that what Plato is, one of the big components of the theory in the Republic is um, Plato develops this view of the human soul, and uh, the human soul is consisting in a number of different elements or different components, um, each of which has a, a, one or more powers or capacities belongs to it. And um, Plato then begins to talk about how the good person is characterized by the ways in which these parts of the soul relate to one another. How do they interact? Are they cooperative with one another? Do they, do they let each other do what they're best at doing and so on and so forth? Or are they constantly in competition with one, one another and they, are they all you know, trying to be in charge and so on and so forth? Um, and, and the good person is the one who has the properly ordered soul, according to Plato. And so in the disappearance of moral knowledge, and Dallas talks about this in several different places in his, in his corpus, but it comes up again in the disappearance of moral knowledge where he says, following a pattern set by Plato, what could justifiably be called the first lesson in moral theory is that moral goodness or justice cannot be understood by reference to particular types of external behaviors or relations to other persons. Rather, one must find it in the internal structure of the self which acts in the soul, the source of the motion or change or conduct of the human being. And then he says, the second lesson is close at hand in book two of the Republic. There the beginnings of a positive theory are established by the identification of those dynamic factors within the human self from which behaviors originate. They turn out to be, on Plato's account, desire, emotion, and thought, or reason. Outward behavior, good or ill, arises out of some combination of these three dynamic factors, and the behavior is morally just or unjust, good or bad, depending on how these factors are combined. Plato's observation is that the good or just person is a person in whom these factors are rightly ordered in terms of the intrinsic natures of the three dynamic dimensions thus identified, that is, in terms of what they are by nature suited to do within personality. So Plato is a teacher of spiritual formation in this second sense of spiritual formation. And not only Plato, Plato but all the other major classical Greek thinkers, Dallas says in this quotation here, which I in the interest of time won't read, but we can come back to it if we need to. Um, and then not only the, the Greek philosophers, but Dallas says pretty much everybody who's ever thought about it has come to this conclusion that um, what matters most for how life goes and ought to go is what we are on the inside. And then again, he even says, um, you know, this has been acknowledged by everyone who's thought deeply about our condition from Moses, Solomon, Socrates, and Spinoza to Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, and Oprah even, current feminists, environmentalists. So there's some important commonality in our understanding of what the problem is and where we need to look to solve it when it comes to you know, human morality. We look to the inside, not to the outside. The, the kind of um, view that we associate with the Pharisees where they're focused on external behaviors, outward acts, and obedience to law um, actually is, is, is not, apparently, from Dallas's point of view, a very common human error. Um, most everyone recognizes that it's about who you are on the inside and how you're constituted and how your, your soul is shaped or your personality is shaped. At this point, we want to talk about Dallas's Vim notion, right? Because central to character formation or spiritual formation, the sense of character formation, is um, the idea of vision, intention, and means. And this is something that Dallas normally talks about when he is explaining how to go about changing your character. But uh, one of the things that he says in a couple of places, it's not very common, but here and there he'll say that actually Vim is not just about changing your character, it's also what maintains your character. Right? It's, uh, so even when you have a, a character that hasn't yet been changed in a positive direction, even if you have a bad character, that's going to be because of the vim that you are holding on to, the vision, intentions, and, intentions and means. And um, what we are seeing in these, in these quotations that we're just looking at is this idea that there is, at some level, a common vision when it comes to character formation among Christian and non-Christian thinkers. There's broad agreement that um, the, the locus of spiritual transformation is the inner person, not the outward act or the behavior. Uh, but that's not all. There, there's, there's deeper agreement on um, the content of an adequate moral vision. 
And uh, Dallas goes on to, to explain that elsewhere. He says that there's widespread agreement, not only that the, the locus of, um, of rightness is the inner person, but also the content of, of rightness or virtue or righteousness is um, agape love. He says a really good person, as Jesus teaches, is anyone who is pervaded with love. Agape love, perhaps the greatest contribution of Christ to human civilization, wills the good of whatever it is directed upon. The teaching about love that still permeates Western civilization at its better moments understands that. The highest calling of moral beings is to love. Long before the coming of Christ, this was obscurely understood. Socrates remarked, according to Plato, that the good do, uh, do their neighbors good and the bad do uh, them evil. And um, it's not only that. I mean, Socrates in the Republic actually argues that um, we owe this kind of goodwill that Dallas is here identifying with agape love. We owe it even to our enemies. So there's a question that comes up, with, what if you know, we defeat some people in battle? What should we do with the enemies we capture? Should we go ahead and kill them? And the answer is, well, no. You, you, should, you should turn them into virtuous people. You should help them you know, become the good people they can be. That's what you should do to your enemies. Uh, that's Socrates' teaching in the Republic. And so Dallas is acknowledging here that you know, this teaching about agape love is not unique to Christ or to Christianity. He does think that there's a special um, role for Christ to play here, obviously, but it's not going to be um, the, the, the difference of night and day where no one else ever realized that love had this uh, sort of central moral importance. And again, um, it's not as if Christ alone knew or taught that love is the center of what is right, obligatory, and good among human beings. It is indeed an open secret, something that everyone deep down knows, if they will but carefully consider it. Good and evil are by nature, uh, or sorry, are by, large, uh, by and large immediately sensed and further reveal themselves to reflection and theoretical elaboration. This is an important point for the view he develops in the disappearance of moral knowledge, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, but this idea that you can sense good and evil, this perception of good, good and evil is the fundamental intuition of the moral life, and it's given even to small children and unsophisticates at all levels, though they may be unable to articulate and defend it. So what we're seeing here is that, that Dallas um, acknowledged and realized that to a an appreciable extent, there was widespread agreement on the, the vision of what human life should be like, what a good person ought to be like. And this is central to character formation itself. The vision that you entertain of the good and of the real, for Dallas, is what guides you. It gives you something to aim at. Um, as you try to shape your character in the right way. And what he's saying here is that um, the Christian vision is not the only one that's going to direct you in basically the right direction. You can get going basically in the right direction by just sort of reasoning about it and by perceiving moral facts in ordinary human experience. Right? So this is a challenging view, perhaps. Now, in the disappearance of moral knowledge, he doesn't talk a whole lot about agape love um, by name, but when he talks about um, the good person as someone who exercises care for those with whom they are immediately in contact, what he's basically getting at is this idea that agape love is a central commitment of the good person. And he discusses the natural human ability to recognize this and to feel the obligation, the pull of the obligation to love others by invoking the insights of a couple of, um, of ethical thinkers, Emmanuel Levinas and then Nude Logstrup. And um, here are a couple of quotations, both from Dallas and then and then from each of them, about um, how it is that we are capable of this fundamental moral intuition where we perceive good and evil, especially the centrality of agape love to goodness. So here's what Dallas has to say about Levinas. He says, Levinas's view culminates with his profound and searching phenomenological analysis of moral obligation as a kind of reciprocal intentionality to an incoming intentionality from or via the face of the other. And what he's talking about here, intentionality is one of these uh, technical terms in philosophy. Uh, it's the, the object directedness of thought. Sometimes Dallas would say it's the, the ofness or aboutness of thought. And the idea here is that you know, some of you know that Dallas did a lot of work on Edmund Husserl, the, the um, 
the phenomenologist, the father of phenomenology. And uh, this was this idea of intentionality was central to uh, Husserl's and Dallas's explanation of how we could actually get beyond our own minds to make contact with things in the real world and know them as they are in themselves. And uh, it's central to his moral epistemology as well. Uh, moral facts are things that you can get in touch with um, by carefully directing your intentionality, your object directedness of thought on, um, on the right sorts of things. And the face of the other for Levinas is uh, a prime locus of morally significant phenomena that each of us can turn our attention to. And if we attend carefully enough to the face of the other, we will find that moral realities sort of emanate from the face of the other and latch onto us in the form of an obligation uh, or a duty. And here's just one um, little set of, of quotes from Levinas that sort of uh, speak to this point. He says, the face, the face of the other, opens the primordial discourse whose first word is obligation. The other faces me and puts me in question and obliges me. But in doing so, the other does not limit but promotes my freedom by arousing my goodness. All right, so and it's, it's kind of, I mean, his language gets very, very flowery and it can often be difficult to follow. But the basic idea here is that when you, when you look at another person and you see their face looking back at you, um, you, you spontaneously and automatically recognize that, that here is an entity with whom I could, and therefore in some sense should, have a, a kind of interactive communicative relationship. You know, if, if, um, if you are unable to recognize the difference between you know, this desk here and another person when they come before your field of conscious experience, we have a problem. He said, and, but no one, really, you know, no one really has that problem. No normally functioning human being at least has that problem. You can tell the difference, and there's this immediate, spontaneous uh, connection that you have with other people, and it's communicative and it's moral in its very nature, and you realize that person has a claim on me and I have a duty to take care of them in some way, shape, or form just by their presence and my awareness of them. Um, Nude Logstrup, who is a, a Lutheran theological eth ethicist, but um, interestingly enough, he argues against the possibility of a distinctively Christian ethics. He says Christian ethics is uh, kind of a misleading title. Um, he argues that Jesus' teachings about love are teachings that simply direct us to things that we should already know from our first person experience of the world, especially the social world of other people. So he wants to say that you know, Jesus' teachings aren't offering anything um, brand new or unknown outside of these particular religious doctrines. He says they're just very poignant and powerful reminders of things that we already have access to on the basis of our own experience. And here um, are a couple of quotes from his book, The Ethical Demand. He says, by our very attitude to one another, we help shape one another's world. By our attitude toward the other person, we help to determine the scope and the hue of his world. We make it large or small, bright or drab, rich or dull, threatening or secure. Herein lies the unarticulated, and one might say anonymous, demand that we take care of the life which trust has placed in our hands. So this idea that um, the demand to take care of the other arises from our sort of mutual vulnerability, our ability to affect one another, and the fact that we're then vulnerable to one another. This is a key point for both uh, Levinas and for, for Logstrup. He says, trust is not of our own making, it's given. Life is so constituted that it cannot be lived except as one person surrenders something of himself to the other person, either by trusting or by asking for trust. One person daring to lay him or herself open to the other in the hope of a response. This is the fundamental phenomenon of ethical life. And so you take Logstrup and compare him to someone like Thomas Hobbes, who acknowledges that we are vulnerable to one another, and who then reasons from this point that, well, what that means is we have a natural right to do anything that we need to do to secure our lives, however nasty it might be. Right? 
Logstrup is denying this. He's saying, I mean, if he was speaking to, to Hobbes, he would say, uh, no, you've missed the point of our vulnerability. If you take that stance, that sort of combative stance, that defensive stance, as a response to our vulnerability to one another, you actually won't be able to enter into a human life. If you, if you were to enter into a, a human life, you have to take that mutual vulnerability as an invitation to trust. And you have to give yourself over to the other person and trust if you're actually going to live a human life. Now, Hobbes kind of gets there, too, in his own weird, warped way. Uh, but um, <laughs> but it's, it's, very, it's very much contrived. It's not, it's not natural. And for Logstrup, it's just natural. I mean, you think of, you know, I don't know, think, think of a, an infant and its mother um, and this sort of connection of trust and this, this sense of duty to care that just naturally arises in that sort of situation. Um, and, you know, try, try to reframe that in Hobbesian terms. You know, the, the child comes out and says, like, you and I, we are locked in a war of all against all, and I'm only going to trust you if you agree to, you know. No. Um, that's, not, that's not how human life works, Logstrip says. The trust is what's natural and spontaneous. Um, so, in any case, this is supposed to be uh, a moral phenomenon that we all, all of us human beings, have access to just in virtue of our being human, if only we'd pay attention to the facts of our own moral experience closely enough. Of course, not everyone does that, but still, the possibility is there for everybody, Dallas thinks. And what's that, what that's really um, giving us insight into is the centrality of agape love to the moral life. So the question, the question then is, given that there's all this sort of overlap between the Christian vision and the non-Christian uh, vision of the moral life, that there's this uh, agreement about the inner locus of goodness, rightness, and, and this um, agreement about the centrality of agape to being a good person, uh, what exactly does Christianity add to the picture? I mean, does it add anything special at all? Um, here's a statement that kind of speaks to this. This is from Disappearance of Moral Knowledge. He says, The Christian version of the good life and the good person in Augustine and afterward retains much of the classical understanding of the self. So, lots taken over from Plato and from Aristotle and so on. It only superimposed upon that understanding a teaching about sin and salvation foreign to the classical sources. In that teaching, an interactive relationship of the individual soul with God became central to moral virtue and rectitude. By contrast, soul management for the Greeks had been a strictly human project, engaging God or the gods only in a few and tangential ways. So from, from this statement, one might think, okay, so the difference between Christianity and, and non-Christian traditions is this idea of the interactive relationship with God. So does that mean that God only interacts with Christians? And Dallas's answer to that, I think, is pretty clearly no. Um, he says in a couple of places, in Knowing Christ Today, that um, you can pretty much take it for granted that God is interacting with everybody all the time as best he can. Um, he says, the fact that God is a being whose most basic nature is agape love for all human beings, regardless of their religion or culture, means that he cares for all human beings. His grace is an active principle in the universe, and the one that we call Jesus is also the cosmic Christ, that is the word or logos of God, which is a light that enlightens everyone. Uh, he says, the Lord is active among human beings generally, not just among Christians. He is their God whether they know it or not. We may be sure that God loves all people and is involved with everyone, religious or non-religious, though they may be unaware of it or reject it if they so choose. And then, a really striking statement, people of other religions or no religion at all may be right with God on the account of the condition of their hearts, despite their misunderstandings about God. If this is so in a given case, it will be because their lives are centered on that same love that is expressed in the person and teachings of Jesus and of his people at their best. It will be because God is love. And if you really do have that kind of agape love in question, God is living in you and you know God, whatever else may be, may or may not be true of you. Right? So this idea here that if you, even from, from natural sources, get this vision of agape love, you know, if you are, if you are Emmanuel Levinas or, or one of his students, someone who's reading him, and you realize, yes, the face of the other, it's all there. Um, it's, I really find myself open and sensitive to this, and it's pulling me into this relationship where I feel compelled to treat 
others with care and goodwill. Or if you're Socrates and you say, no, no, the only rational thing is for me and for us to, to care for others and try to help them become virtuous people. And so you're looking at them with an eye of goodwill. Um, and that really is the center of your life as a human being, then Dallas would have said, you have found God, and God is living in you through that insight. And that doesn't require you to know anything about Jesus at all, but he wants to say, that actually is Jesus living in you. This is the inward illumination of God, speaking, as it were, directly to your soul. All right? And what you've, what you've recognized here is the fundamental nature of reality as embodied in God himself, in his Trinitarian structure, wherein agape love is just the very nature of ultimate reality. Interaction with God is not what's unique about Christianity. What is? Is there anything? Dallas thinks the answer is yes. Um, he thinks that, that despite this overlap between um, Christian and non-Christian traditions when it comes to the, the, the moral vision in question, uh, the, the inwardness of, of, uh, of, of moral of value and virtue and, and the um, agape-centeredness of the life. Despite that overlap, he says that, that these non-Christian traditions, they really do um, come up deficient in a lot of ways because they don't have what he's going to call a, an adequate transcend, transcendental principle, which um, secures your commitment to the good that you know even when the going gets tough. He says the Christian vision, basically, what it adds is this kind of motivation and this kind of empowerment that inspires a commitment that can really stick with the moral project when you might otherwise be inclined to give up on it. And you know, dry, rational insight, the likes of which Socrates uh, kind of had about this, that might not be enough to sustain you. Um, and, you know, okay, as compelling as the face of the other may be, when push comes to, to shove and you have to ask yourself, well, whose face should I save, mine or the others, you know, when, when you're both under threat, um, he says that you can't count on those kinds of insights to motivate self-sacrificial love where you're sticking with the good even to the point of death. So as I put it on the handout here, 7a. Christianity provides a uniquely powerful transcendental principle in light of which renunciation of evil, even to the point of death, makes sense. And what is this transcendental principle? Well, the transcendental principle, and I'm just going to skip through some of these slides here in the interest of time, um, the transcendental pr principle is the, the vision of God as loving Father, the vision of the kingdom of God that goes hand in hand with that, and then the vision of the passion and the cross. So these three distinctive elements add some motivational content to the other, what otherwise is a common vision of the good. And this sustains people when they come under threat, even to the point of death, Dallas wants to say. Um, here in this slide, he's talking about how, you know, what the deficiencies of, of, the, of the Platonic view were. Um, here he's talking about the vision of the kingdom and he says, um, the will can only act from ideas or representations on the one hand and emotions or, or feelings on the other. And he says, the traditional pattern of Christian conversion or recovery must begin with a new thought that comes from outside the entire human system. It's one which leads to new emotions and makes possible a new act of will. The new thought is, of course, the information content of the gospel. And this is Dallas's gospel of the kingdom, not, not uh, you know, some other version of the gospel, right? Um, it is a new picture of the real world I live in. That world turns out to be um, made and governed by a person who loved this world and myself so much that he sent his son to save me from total ruin. Now, why does this vision matter? Why does it have the impact it does? Dallas thinks that this matters and has the power that it does because it enables you to see yourself as safe and secure in God's hands despite any threats that might come your way. And this frees you uh, to, to um, let God take care of your well-being and uh, to give up on securing your own well-being for yourself. That's the main point of, of the vision of the kingdom as far as uh, Dallas is concerned, or so it seems to me. Um, here he's talking about non-Christian systems lacking an adequate transcendental principle. Um, here he's talking about uh, systems of morality, and the point of systems of morality is to enable you to do what you don't want to do. 
and to, able, to enable you to avoid doing what you do want to do, right? So he's talking about you know, avoiding temptation basically here. Um, and, and this is the problem. He wants to say that, that other systems of moral formation or character formation lacked the ability to really inspire people to give up on doing what their immediate, immediate desires tell them they want to do, and, um, and then to avoid doing some of the things that their immediate desires tell them they, they do want to do, um, and to you know, stick with the good and not give in to temptation. That's, that's the major weakness of non-Christian visions of character formation. And here are some statements about the significance of the cross. Um, it again has to do with self-denial and rejecting your immediate desires, which are often for unworthy things. So he says the cross symbolizes a radical strategy in bringing humans back to God from their bondage to Satan and the world. Embracing the cross with Jesus is to be our salvation. It is to release ourselves into the realm of God, into God's care, and to stop trying to work the human system of power and desire to get what we want. So again, you don't have to secure your own well-being. Um, if you did, you might be tempted to cut some corners, morally speaking, to, uh, to make sure that you're going to be okay, and uh, even if, if that means other people aren't going to be, even if they're going to suffer. But he says, nope, we don't have to do that because God has got our back. He's going to take care of us, and I don't have to do anything that's morally questionable to um, make sure I'm going to be okay. And the cross is a profound illustration of this fact. If Jesus can go through that, with confidence that he's still going to be okay in the hands of God, then, then surely you don't have to you know, cheat on your taxes or whatever the temptation might be, right? Um, another statement, we live in a sensualist culture, and that's where the problems come from, a sensualist culture, right, uh, given to sensation. Everything from the degradation of sports to obesity to the horrible things that are done to little children uh, to the CEO scandals, all of this fundamentally derives from people pursuing feelings. Desire itself is not bad, but desire is not meant to master our lives, and that is what we're seeing. We have conceded the right of desire. Now that is what the teaching of the cross is directed at. Jesus takes the image of the cross before anyone believes he is going to die because he understands the power of it, and what the cross means is the ultimate frustration of desire. And if you don't have that settled, then desire will veto you until it gets its way. So you'll never be able to make progress in character formation, he wants to say, until you settle this fundamental issue, putting desire away. And then finally, the meaning of the cross of Christ in human experience is that it stops any mere I want to from functioning as an adequate reason for action. The cross is therefore central to the moral life of humanity. Right. So he does think that, that in order for us to really be solid moral people, to really have settled characters of virtue, we need to have a vision that is sufficiently inspiring that it's going to keep us committed to virtue and goodness even when our lives are, are threatened. And he just doesn't think that other visions of, uh, for, for moral formation have anything nearly as compelling as what Christianity offers in terms of God the loving Father who will take care of you, His kingdom, which is your being connected to Him, you know, you're living under the rule of God and under the providential care of God, and then finally the inspiring example of Jesus in His passion and suffering on the cross. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you. <laughs>